uh, from MIT and Peking University talking about quantum algorithms for escaping set points. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about quantum algorithms for escaping from saddle points. And this is a joint work with Chen Yijia and Jia Qilong. And actually, uh, I'm currently uh, still doing my postdoc at MIT, but I will uh, formally join Peking University in this uh, fall semester. OK, so let's get started. So today, I'm going to talk about optimization. So for optimization, in general, we are going to have an n-dimensional function that maps r to the n to r. And the goal is to minimize this function. And such kind of optimization problem is a core topic in math, theoretical computer science, operations research, et cetera. So previously, there has been a lot of study for such kind of optimization problem. And I think in general, people are quite interested about their approval guarantee. So a main class that have been uh, extensively studied is the convex optimization problem. So it is well known that convex optimization can be solved in polynomial time. And there are a lot of uh, well-known methods, such as the Ipsoid method, uh, interior point method, et cetera. So like um, uh, in, in classical theory, people have been really pushing forward to get the best understanding of uh, convex optimization algorithms. And the best known result is actually uh, due to least it for one hella. So if we want to have a bound in terms of like polynomial in terms of dim dimension n, but only like polylog in terms of accuracy, uh, basically we want to have a uh, log one or epsilon here. The state of that result due to least it for one hella has complexity like a, a quadratic in terms of query and a cubic in terms of time. So and actually, um, there has been a, a, a following follow-up work along this line. So basically, quantum it is known that assume if you have such kind of quantum evaluation oracle. So basically, we can evalu evaluate the corresponding function in superposition. And also uh, for optimization, there is typically a convex set such that we require this x to be. In. So if we have this kind of, uh, we can query for whether a point is set uh, inside this uh, convex set or not, which is called a membership oracle. If we can also do this in superposition. Uh, we know that uh, there is previous work due to uh, Eperdon et al. and also Chaprabarty et al. They can basically solve the problem in only like linear quantum queries and similar in cubic time. So this is a very nice story, a very uh, also a very brief story about convex optimization. And you may ask whether this is the end of the story. So actually, there are much more things in optimization other than convex optimization. And in particular, for instance, maybe from the pers perspective of machine learning, there are at least two main concerns for this. So on the one hand, for instance, uh, a lot of uh, loss, uh, a lot of loss functions, machine learning models. So basically, we know that if we want to train a machine learning model, it is just equivalent to optimizing a certain loss function. Such kind of function, machine learning are typically non-convex. So in particular, for instance, this is just like very good looking. This is a convex function, and we know that as convex function, it actually has a unique local minimum, which is just a global one. But this is just too ideal. And what actually um, people encounter in real situations is something like this. And this is not so good because it has so many local minima. So just like if you just uh, trivially use the optimization algorithm, this is not going to work. And there are also some other concerns that in, in particular in practice, I think especially for, for these days, for instance, like uh, optimization in machine learning is that in many common cases, we typically have huge dimension n, but sometimes I think we are okay with relatively large absolute. I mean, a lot of like data set are robust and, some, and also for a lot of situations, we are not that careful about the precision factor. So in particular, for instance, as I just mentioned that a lot of co-optimization bounds, they basically have a poly in terms of n, but poly log in terms of one or absolute. So if we got to choose, I think in a lot of real applications, we may actually want the log to be in front of n instead of in front of n over epsilon. So this is actually something we really want to pursue for. And actually such kind of algorithm are called almost dimensional free math. Okay, so let's now talk about non-commercialization because this is what after all we have to encounter now. So the most common method for uh, optimization in general and also works for non optimization is the gradient descent method. So basically, it is a iterative method that at iteration t here, assume that you are at a point x t, you are going to move forward. That assume you have a gradient, you know the gradient at this point, and you are going to have a step size, and you are going to move forward like this. So this gradient descent method is actually working uh, very well. If on the other hand, for instance, if you know the function is L smooth, uh, basically satisfies this kind of delicious property in terms of the gradient, you can show that using like uh, like uh, L over epsilon squared iterations, you can basically reach a point whose gradient is uh, at most epsilon. So this is very good. 
continuous like the first order derivative of the function. This is typically called like the epsilon approximate of first order stationary point. The question is, is, is this good enough? So let's just take an example of this landscape. So the landscape that I just showed in the previous page. So the one main issue that for a non non-convex organization, especially in high dimensional situation is the set of point problem. So for instance, in this landscape, we have this, this, and this plateau is also like a set of point. So let's in particular, like take a look at this set of point. So assume that if you are maybe at this point, if you do, do gradient descent, you will move forward, uh, actually, or you will go down at the beginning, but unfortunately you will be trapped at a set of point. And similarly at this side, if you do gradient descent, you'll be trapped like here and also like here. So this is something not really good. And for instance, we really want to have something uh, instead that we want to reach some local minima like this. And this is really what we want. So, and also on the other hand, I think in general, I think these are some general points, but actually uh, most of them are actually true in, in, in most situations is that for a lot of problems, local minima are actually uh, not that bad. They're actually nearly as good as um, the global minima. And they are just supported by some landscape results. But it is known that saddle points, like the saddle points I just showed in the previous page, are typically quite bad and actually can give highly suboptimal solutions. But unfortunately, saddle points are ubiquitous and finding the global minima is in general empty hard. So from a theoretical perspective, I guess if you want to solve a non concretization problem, typically the first step is that we want to escape from saddle points. And for instance, we are satisfied with like an absolute approximate local minimum. Actually, this is actually a little bit hand wavy and like a more precise definition should be like absolute approximate second order stationary point. So why second order? So here we really want to uh, make sure that the curvature looks very well. So we not only want to have the, the assumption that the gradient is small, but also we want to make sure that the, at the point you, you, you gave me this uh, x epsilon, this Hessian matrix is close to a, a positive semi-definite matrix. So basically the, the smallest eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix is, you see is actually not a very large uh, uh, negative number here. And also here to, to, make, uh, the, the, to make this work, we also need an uh, extra assumption that the function f here is uh, rho Hessian distance. So basically a second order here, a second order derived here is, is also have this kind of, also enjoy such kind of delicious property. So this square root of rho uh, times epsilon is just, uh, this is just standard, it's just a standard choice in existing literature. Or in other, uh, on the other side, you may think of this as, just this is like a second order property and you think about Taylor approximation. So this just is the thing that commonly appears in Taylor approximation, but the second order you just square that. And this actually, this is the most like the, the most uh, common choice of the parameters here to be uh, to be existing like the, the epsilon and the square root of rho times epsilon. But actually you can make some other choices and this, but this is like the standard thing uh, that we are going to discuss about today. Okay, so let's now talk about existing results in escaping set of points and actually we are going to introduce our results. So this is just the list of the previous works. And actually it is well known that if you have a Hessian oracle, I mean, if you uh, can query for the Hessian matrix at, at, at the, uh, the, 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 the Hessian matrix at the, at the points that you gave to me, and actually this can be uh, done uh, very efficiently. This is just like something like the Newton method and they're just like improved version of the Newton method. Actually, this, it is shown in the Nestorov and Poyak's uh, results in like 15 years ago that basically the query complexity can be something like one or epsilon to the 1.5. So there are some uh, follow-up works and actually the main focus along this line is to improve the Oracle. So why do we want to uh, be, be cautious about that? So although like this kind of hash Oracle thing is like a folklore, maybe you can use the Newton method to solve the problem. But the issue is that this is the hash matrix is an N by N matrix. And this is just too costly in practice because just, written, just uh, writing down the whole matrix uh, is going to have a cost of N squared. And if the N here is large, this is just too expensive. And as you can see, it is a trend in the classical literature here is that we want to use simpler and simpler Oracle while well, we want to keep like a polylog bound in terms of the dimension factor N here. And, and for instance, there's like Oracle called the Hessian vector product. And actually what is the most important thing is that uh, in this uh, results due to Gina et al, it can be shown that only using the gradient Oracle, I mean, at the point X, you tell me the corresponding gradient uh, like the Nabla FX, uh, you only using the gradient oracle, which is the first order information, you can actually reach, uh, you can actually escape from saddle points and reach second order stationary points. And this is really seminal results 
to to Jian Hao and prove uh, such kind of things. So in this work, we uh, we uh, follow this kind of trend. Actually, we use an even simpler oracle. So we use the quantum evaluation oracle. So we, we do the quantum oracle does not even require the gradient. So we only have the zeros of the information that we can calculate the function in superposition. And actually, we have such kind of bound. And actually, in terms of the bound here, we actually matches the best known classical result to Jian Hao in terms of our epsilon dependence. And furthermore, we can achieve a cubic quantum speed up in terms of m. So their classical bound is log n to the six, and our quantum bound here is only log n to the two. And I just mentioned the oracle is also similar here. So this is the main result that I'm going to introduce uh, today. And I think uh, later uh, in the, uh, the next part of my talk, I'm going to introduce the technical details for this. Okay, so the main idea for, in general, for escaping from set of points, I mean, starting from the classical work due to Jin et al. is this idea called perturbed gradient descent. And actually, this is not uh, uh, very hard to understand. So as I just mentioned at the, uh, at the previous slide, so if you just do gradient descent, so unfortunately, you will be trapped at the set of point like this. Or maybe if you do this, you will also be unfortunately trapped at the set of point. But actually, you don't have to be that rigid. Maybe you want to think, think about some idea like this that you want to shake the point when the gradient is too small. So for instance, if you do gradient uh, descent um, uh, um, like again and again, maybe you are at this point. If you are at the, the point around this, you will notice that gradient descent won't move forward a lot, and actually because the gradient is just too small. So if you're actually at such kind of point, you can just shake it. And for instance, you're lucky enough, if you shake to this point, then you are actually quite good, because if you later uh, do gradient descent, you will uh, actually uh, you are getting down to, to this point, to, to later points, actually you're quite good because you have already successfully escaped from the set of point. So this is just like a very rough idea and very intuitive. Uh, and I guess it is um, uh, quite easy to understand, but there are some uh, thoughts that we want to be careful about. So for instance, uh, we want to be careful about the radius of the perturbation. So if this is too large, for instance, the radius is as large as this, you want to be careful because then with a very uh, actually, uh, actually it's, it's not, uh, you're going to have a non-negligible prob probability that you are probably going to be, is a radius. You're going to move backward like this and this, which is not something you really want to uh, uh, see. And actually, on the other hand, if the, the, the perturbation radius is too small, for instance, if it's as small as this, then the perturbation will work, but it actually will only move the point a little bit, I mean, from this point to this point then you probably still need a lot of iterations of gradient descent to, to really move to this direction, actually escape from the center point. So this choice of the radius is actually uh, quite tricky. And also you want to be uh, careful about the way that you want to make the perturbation. For instance, this is just like the way I draw a ball here, but maybe maybe you want to draw a square and maybe you want to consider some other, like maybe Gaussian distributions or something like that. So what is the most efficient approach here? And also uh, we, we have been thinking, talking about gradient descent, gradient descent. And actually there are some alternatives of the gradient descent, maybe some other methods can uh, move forward faster. So these are like the, the three main points about like this uh, very intuitive idea of uh, perturbed gradient descent. And actually the, the work of Jin et al just follow this approach and make some uh, changes and actually make everything <coughs> rigorous. So in uh, the work of Jin et al, instead of the vanilla version of the gradient descent, their work used a method called the next sort of accelerated gradient descent. So this is something I'm probably not going to introduce a lot today because this is like a folklore uh, knowledge in, in uh, optimization theory. And if you're interested, maybe you can just check Wikipedia or corresponding textbooks. So just using the next sort of uh, accelerated gradient descent actually can do the job. And also on the other hand, uh, the perturbation radius in that paper is uh, specifically chosen to be something like epsilon over log n to the five. So in that paper, it is, it is going uh, got to be like epsilon over some poly log n. So epsilon is not going to be enough. And the poly, it, after making some calculations, it has shown that the degree of the log n here got to be a log n to the five. So the, in their work, uh, in the work of Tian et al, the final algorithm is that if the, uh, uh, the, the norm of the gradient is uh, smaller than epsilon and no perturbation has been uh, happening like log n steps, your, uh, the, 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 the algorithm just going to make a perturbation uh, uniformly in such kind of ball uh, with, with such kind of radius. And actually it can be shown that using this, uh, after making the perturbation, you do accelerated gradient descent. So it can be shown that it is going to take a 
approximately log n steps to uh, move, to make sure that the function is going to decrease by like uh, one over log n to the five. And actually the convergence rate, uh, only speaking of in terms of epsilon, is like one over epsilon to the 1.75. So if you put everything together, the overall computational cost is going to be log into the six or epsilon to 1.75. So this is just like a very quick sketch about what happened in the classical state of our result if you didn't at all. So next, a very natural question here is that whether we can uh, give a quantum speed out following such kind of approach. So our intuition is that we, we, from, uh, we think about this from a very high level perspective. So we notice that in this algorithm, uh, the perturbation really plays a crucial role, uh, a crucial role here. But we notice that the, I think the main obstacle here is just like the classical radius is too bad. I mean, making some calculations, you see like this. Uh, actually, you have like a log into the fan factor here. So, very natural question here is that can we give a quantum speed up for this step? So maybe in general we want to uh, maybe we say this is like a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. Maybe we still want to do this kind of gradient descent. But just for this very single step for this uh, perturbation kind of thing. Can we actually make uh, the story, uh, we may we maybe uh, make a more clever choice here. So in particular, I think uh, from a high level pers perspective, so if you're near a subtle point, so this is really like, uh, uh, we, if you want to say from the subtle point, it's really like we want to say some, some poor landscapes that we, do, we don't really want. And actually, this actually somehow really like the quantum tunneling effect in, in terms of quantum mechanics. So for instance, like uh, this is like a figure that I copied from the internet, so classically, if you have like a potential well here, you probably do gradient descent. You will actually, if you do gradient descent, you're actually just going to fall back. And it's actually quite difficult for classical algorithm to climb up such kind of hill. But quantumly, if you have a potential well like this, you can make some calculations into the Schrodinger's equation. You're going to have a non-negligible probability that you can turn it through from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So I think um, if, uh, if this, like this talk is too long to read, I mean, a TLDR for this talk for one sentence that we just make the idea of rhythmic using a quantum simulation of the Schrodinger's equation. So this is like the Schrodinger's equation, I mean, for this wave function here. And the main trick here is that we, uh, we basically consider this function f, we just uh, uh, choose the function f, this potential uh, well here, to be the function that we are going to optimize, the, uh, we are going to optimize with. And actually, uh, when we are actually around a saddle point, we are just going to use quantum simulation to make sure that we can uh, escape from saddle point much faster than the classical gradient descent. Okay, this is like uh, something still very uh, high level and maybe let me get into more details. So uh, let's just first make this assumption that near a saddle point, because like the, at a saddle point, you see the courage is just going to be uh, uh, roughly speaking characterized by the by the Hessian matrix. So maybe let's first say that the function is well approximated by a quadratic function. So at, after having this assumption, so for instance, you have the function f x to have such kind of form, and we assume that we start with a Gaussian, a standard Gaussian wave packet. So it's a standard Gaussian wave packet like this. So keep in mind that this is just like the, the, the coefficient of, of the quantum states. And if you consider like the magnitude, you actually have a squared here, and this just becomes the standard Gaussian distribution. So the main point is that assume you have a quadratic uh, potential uh, function f here, and you, can, you consider a simulation of the Gaussian wave packet. The, the, the main effect we are going to uh, see is that, the, is that the, after you evolve uh, in the Schrodinger's equation, the, the wave function is still going to be Gaussian. And there is a very interesting phenomenon in terms of the change of the variance. So if the lambda here is larger than zero, this is just going to be something behave as a harmonic oscillator. And you're actually going to see the variance is basically as a Hamann oscillator is basically like a like a cosine function up to some shifts. But I think another on the other hand, it is very interesting that the lambda here is actually uh, smaller than zero. In that case, you will encounter an exponential uh, rate of uh, dispersion. That basically this uh, uh, this uh, variance is going to grow up exponentially fast. And when lambda e equals to zero, this is a, a quadratic function here. So. As a summary is that uh, for this specific phenomenon, we are going to have the exponential dispersion rate when lambda is smaller than zero, quadratic for lambda equals to zero, and at most constant in this harmonic oscillator effect when lambda is larger than zero. So what does that mean? So this is basically the lemma that we showed in this paper. And actually, um, maybe this is a little bit abstract to, uh, uh, to, to read, but let's talk, talking, uh, talk like this. So if we are near a set of points, then by the math definition, 
we know that at least one of the eigenvalue is going to be smaller than minus uh, square root of uh, uh, rho times epsilon. So uh, uh, because the dispersion is just so large and also uh, given the assumption that the function is, is, is quadratic, uh, even all the other directions go backward. I mean, for instance, if there are like a positive uh, uh, eigen directions and maybe it's just like the harmonic oscillator effect. But this, we know that it is not a constant uh, of, uh, of uh, all these kind of directions. Then with high probability, the function value still decreases much. So for instance, if this is like the, the set of point, and we know because we know that this is a set of point that we want to escape from, and uh, we know that one of the eigenvalue is at least uh, at most uh, this minus uh, square root of times rho, the uh, square root of uh, rho times epsilon. So this is going to be the, the direction of the exponential uh, dispersion, and this is going to be maybe, maybe like all the other noises or, or the backwards. After all, we are going to still move from this point. Oh, sorry. After all, we are going to still move from this point to that point, and we can actually see that for this point, doing gradient descent is still quite good. Actually, we can stay from the side of point. So this is only the perturbation step, but how does that combine with gradient descent? So in our work, we, uh, we basically have, uh, roughly speaking, have a quantum algorithm like this. So as I, as I mentioned, this is really like a hybrid quantum classical algorithm that we just do perturb gradient descent with quantum simulation. So we similar similar compared to similarly uh, to the classical algorithm, we also we don't perturb a lot. We we have basically we have a trigger. The trigger is that the 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 the, the gradient is going to be that too small. So as long as the gradient, so when the, the gradient is, is too small and you have not perturbed the point for for uh, some iterations, I think basically for the thirty prime, we basically choose to be something like uh, uh, log n. So if you have not uh, perturbed for a while. Uh, basically, then you just do the perturbation. But what is totally different compared to the classical algorithm is that our perturbation is truly quantum. So it's not like we draw like a ball with radius and this radius like epsilon over log into the five. We just do the quantum simulation as I just mentioned in the previous slide. And actually the algorithm is just like this. So we just do quantum simulation. And after we do quantum simulation, we just do gradient descent. And actually we do a few steps of gradient descent and actually uh, if we the perturb is not success, uh, not uh, successful, and after we trick the uh, this like the number of iterations here is more than a, a script t um, prime again, we are probably going to do do it again. But in general, it's just like we replace this step uh, by the sorry we replace the classical uh, perturbation by radius by this quantum simulation, and the other parts are just similar. So I think there are still some other things that we want to uh, pin down because this is, uh, we, we just mentioned that we, uh, we use the idea of quantum simulation to replace the classical perturbation. But a very natural question is that what is the computational cost of this, this step? So in particular, I mean, uh, we, we talk about like, we, we want to have iterations, queries of the function f. What is the quantum query complexity of simulating the Schrodinger's equation? So this is like the first remaining question. And actually, uh, because the Schrodinger's equation, this kind of wave function is, is just essentially a partial differential equation. So we follow closely to a previous uh, quantum PD solver due to Charles et al. So in Charles et al, uh, the, it's just like uh, we want to consider some numerical method. We have to discretize the whole space into some uh, grids with set length A. And we are happy to see that the, the work of Charles et al can choose the A to be something like poly in terms of N, a log one or epsilon. And basically in this case, this um, uh, this uh, Laplacian operator is actually going to be uh, discretized to this uh, kind of Laplacian matrix and actually going to be the Laplacian matrix of the graph of the grids. And actually uh, you can, uh, this can be encountered by this kind of identity here. So basically uh, after making some calculations, you can make sure that the original uh, Schrodinger's equation in the continuous space after making the discretization, it is going to be uh, such, uh, going to be reduced to such kind of problem. And this kind of problem, this, this L is just going to be, as I just mentioned, the Laplacian matrix of the graph of the grid. And this matrix B is actually going to be a diagonal matrix such that the entry for the grid and X, uh, X is going to be have a uh, entry FX on the corresponding diagonal entry. So this is probably going to be uh, looking uh, much more familiar because this is a standard Hamiltonian simulation problem. And furthermore, we want to be, uh, be, uh, be uh, even more notice that this uh, Hamiltonian simulation problem has a very special structure uh, in the sense that this part, this Laplacian part is actually dominating because the set length A here is actually small. So, so this part is going to have a much larger uh, norm compared to the B part. 
So this part of Laplace is going to be dominating, but actually this is independent of the potential well here, uh, because this is just like the way how you're going to discretize the space to solve the partial differential equation. So this is actually independent of the queries that we are going to make. The query is only going to be depend on the matrix B here, which is going to encode the function uh, evaluation here. But this is actually diagonal, and we all know that uh, in Hamiltonian simulation, diagonal Hamiltonian is very easy to be simulated. And actually for this kind of uh, special structure, we have like one part and another part, uh, there is a, a known technique quantum simulation called quantum simulation under the interaction picture due to low and VF, and actually we just call this a result uh, from them. And actually we make some calculation, we show that the quantum query complexity of simulating this specific kind of uh, Schrodinger's equation is roughly speaking going to be like to the O of uh, T times log N up to like a polylog factors in what happened in the bracket. So this is very good because uh, we, uh, as we mentioned, that uh, the, the 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 we we really want to make the simulation of the Schrodinger's equation here. So we uh, we are very happy to see that uh, classically we have the uh, like maybe t t number of iterations. Quantumly we only incur like a log overhead in terms of the simulation here. And the t factor here is is they must exist because in general for quantum simulation you are going to have a linear overhead. And this is not something. This is just in general in that inevitable here. So this is the, the question for the quantum uh, query complexity. And there is another very natural question here is that I think, as I just uh, discussed, that we talk about partial differential equation and basically this potential well for the quadratic case. But another very natural question is that is the quadratic approximation a too strong assumption? So this is definitely a very natural question here. And we are happy to, 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 to mention that uh, the answer is no. In general, for the general case, can be approximated by the quadratic case with a very small overhead. So, for, for proving this, we actually call some existing tools from uh, partial differential equation and functional analysis. So, in particular, there's a paper due to John Bogan, who is actually a Fields Medal winner, that there is a, a very solid result on growth of the sublift norms in linear Schrodinger's equation. And actually, call, uh, by calling their work, we can show that the change of the, the gradient in L2 norm is at most like a uh, like log t to some uh, uh, fixed like uh, constant alpha here. And actually using this result to John Borgen, we can show that uh, if we have the original function f to be the potential uh, function, and also on the other hand, we have a quadratic approximation near the set of point. So this f and, and the function f q here. So we have these two potential function, we, and we consider corresponding simulation uh, of the Schrodinger's equation. And we want to basically, uh, and we want to measure the outcome and compare the corresponding uh, uh, distribution. So one is like the, the peak C and the other is peak C prime. So we notice that the, the total various, uh, total uh, vari uh, variational distance between these two distributions, they're actually quite small and actually making some calculation, it is bounded by this fact, uh, by this expression. So as long as the time simulation time T is small enough, this is basically non-negligible. And basically after making uh, some calculations, we can make sure that uh, even if uh, we have the quadratic, uh, quadratic approximation, this is only a small overhead and everything uh, as I just mentioned can still carry us over uh, basically the, the complexity bounds. Okay, I think this basically covers the technical details that I want to mention and maybe let's just put everything together. So the final quantum algorithm is going to look like this. So like the, the name of the algorithm is a little bit long here, but it is like perturbed accelerated gradient descent because uh, this is also what is achieved in, uh, in the work of uh, classical work of Tian et al. They replaced accelerated gradient descent by gradient descent. But furthermore, we don't like perturb with this kind of radius, the uniform distribution, but we just replace it by, by quantum simulation. So uh, once uh, you know well that, for instance, we have been no per there has been no perturbation in like uh, script T uh, prime steps, we just make the perturbation. And after making the perturbation, we just do this kind of accelerated gradient descent. So in this work, we can actually uh, basically uh, by uh, working through all these kind of ideas, we can show that the quantum current complexity for solving the escaping from subtle point problem is at most like like this factor. So this part is exactly the same compared to the classical algorithm, but this iota squared is, is this iota is just everything with law, roughly speaking. I mean, also you have, of course, you have a like log n uh, in terms of dimension here. So the classical work uh, in the Tian et al. State, uh, state of the art work have a bound like iota to the six power. And here we want to have a iota to the two. So why is this the case? So I guess this is probably going to make the situation 
uh, more clear. So roughly speaking, the algorithm has uh, three steps as I just mentioned. So if the gradient is, is large, we apply accelerated gradient descent. And if the gradient is small, we run quantum simulation with time like O of log n and measure the outcome. And actually we apply, for, for, for simplicity, we can actually apply a gradient descent for log n iterations. And we then go to step one or step two, depending of, on the norm of the, the gradient descent. So classically, the bound is basically, I mean, I mean, this part is, is um, I mean, we can directly compare them, but they are a little bit different. Because classically, it's just making the perturbation, you uh, you do like log n steps of uh, gradient descent. But quantumly here, we just make log n steps of, sorry, lo, uh, the, the simulation time to be log n, which is like a continuous factor here. But roughly speaking, this overhead is the same. So quantum is much better in terms of function decrease so classically, the decrease is so slow, so slow, but constantly we can make a constant decrease here. But on the other hand, there is another log overhead in terms of quantum simulation, we, which we got to pay like a log n factor here. But classically, if you just if after making the, the classical perturbation, you just like just do it. So this is a constant overhead here. So this is the this constitutes the main difference between quantum and classical. So classically, it is going going to be log n to the six. So this uh, log n, I mean the either the classical or the discrete uh, value of number of simulations or or like the uh, quantum data, the, the, the time, continuous time of the simulation. So basically they are going to all be the log n factor, but what really makes difference is these, uh, the other two factors here. Okay, so this is the, the point about how we are actually going to, actually we have achieved the quantum uh, speed up, the cubic quantum speed up in terms of escaping from set a point. And the later part is that we want to uh, fulfill the, the, the claim that we actually, uh, we can do everything by only quantum evaluation oracle. So it is clear that for the part of quantum simulation, we actually only use the evaluation oracle, but how about gradient computation? So this is actually not really, uh, uh, this is not really novel, but actually this is a existing result due to uh, Stephen Jordan. And Stephen Jordan previously showed that for a uh, common optimization and for smooth function, you can actually uh, 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 use the only quantum evaluation oracle to compute classical gradients. So maybe let me just very quickly uh, go through the idea. The idea is just like uh, you, if you have this kind of evaluation oracle, you can make it to make like a, you can use a standard trick called a phase kickback to make it to be some kind of uh, phase queries to the to the function here. And, and you know that if you have a smooth function, you are you can actually approximate the function into like the, the first order Taylor approximation like this. And if you apply this kind of function in a supervisation, uniform supervisation around a small mesh at a point that you want to compute the gradient, you're actually going to have such kind of form. And after having such kind of form, you can just apply like an inverse quantum Fourier transform to extract all the information of the partial derivatives simultaneously. And I think roughly speaking, this is like a continuous version of the Burston was running algorithm. But I think I think for today's time, I probably won't have uh, to cover this in great detail, but I think uh, this is actually um, uh, well covered in pre, uh, in the in, in Stephen Jordan's paper, as well as the previous uh, two uh, quantum optimization papers uh, due to an Apple at all and also Chakrabarty at all. Okay, so maybe let's just quickly uh, skip this. So basically we just make everything robust. I mean, uh, like the for, uh, for the for the perfect case, just we don't have this C here, but it's just like after making some calculations, we, we, we can replace all the gradient descent and, and accelerated gradient descent, those kind of calculations by only using the Jordan's error with the quantum evaluation or and actually we can make sure that all the calculations can go through here. And actually this is like the theorem we first proved uh, for the for the escaping from set of points in the previous part, but we want to be careful that here we actually not only use the query on to the to the UF where we make uh, the queries to 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 make the quantum simulation, but also the gradients. But I think after making this calculation, basically using Jordan's algorithm to replace all the gradient computation by quantum validation oracle, we are actually proud to say that we can actually delete this and we just reduce everything to just the the query to the evaluation oracle. And I think on the other hand, basically our calculations uh, through that, we essentially show the robustness of escaping from set of points by perturbed gradient descent. Uh, because uh, we know that gradient descent uh, due to Jordan's algorithm actually has some noise. Actually, we can make sure that this does not uh, like disturb the performance of perturbed gradient descent too much. So this kind of robustness, well, I think it is it's just intrinsic to such kind of framework of uh, perturbed gradient descent. And I guess, uh, which may be of independent interest, maybe to even the classical uh, community here to let them know that such kind of algorithm really interests robustness. 
Okay, so I think at last, maybe uh, let me uh, also very briefly discuss about some numerical experiments. So actually we perform some numerical experiments for our work. So for instance, we uh, consider quantum simulation on non-quadratic uh, potential wells. So in this uh, case, we consider like a quartic function, you know, fourth power function here. So basically we show, uh, we, we uh, numerically examine that for such kind of uh, uh, quartic function with two local minima, uh, doing quantum simulation really like squeezes along this uh, direction of the two local minima. And actually it is really going to, to these two points. And actually uh, for them, I think we uh, also, yeah, we also uh, consider a situation for, for a cubic function. So for this cubic function, it is uh, specifically designed to have a structure where you are going to have like a, you're going to uh, have a hill in the middle and actually it is like, you are going to have two ridges along these two direction. So what we really encounter is that some, I think this is like the, the, the nicest uh, experiment that we, we, we made during, the, during our project is that we really observe the phenomenon of like wave interference. So you can see that we make these two ridges and we, if we make the quantum simulation here, the, the wave interference really happens here. I mean, this, you see like these, um, these parts. I mean, this is really something intrinsic to, to waves, to quantum. And this is just totally different compared to uh, the, the classical optimization methods. And actually, um, this, this is more like uh, these two experiments, more like proof of principle uh, results for uh, non quadratic uh, potential fields for quartic for uh, cubic functions. And actually, we also make a very careful analysis about, about the dimension claim. I mean, whether our quantum algorithm is really faster than the classical algorithms in terms of dimension dependence. And we are happy to say that actually, this is the situation. I mean, classically, we choose the uh, uh, for for this uh, specific setting of the parameters, and also I think this is the part of a quartic function that we uh, we have shown. So we choose the classical iteration number to be something like like uh, fifty times uh, times log n squared plus fifty, and quantum like thirty times log n. So we can show that even in this situation, the quantum the quantum simulation algorithm is better than the classical algorithm in in all of the cases. I mean, uh, for the for this uh, large part, actually, it decreases faster than the classical algorithm. You see, like classical algorithm is actually um, more easy to be trapped uh, compared to the class uh, compared to the quantum algorithm. Yes. So I guess for the time, I should probably wrap up and let the audiences ask some questions. So the main result is that we give a quantum algorithm for absolute approx uh, approximate local minimum with only like log n squared or epsilon to the one point seven five queries. So the outcome is like a cubic, this is the cubic spell in terms of n, and also we match the classical best known uh, result in terms of epsilon. So uh, from the technical perspective, we uh, achieve the speed up by using quantum simulation to escape from set of points. And also we re reduce classical gradients to quantum evaluations by drawdown's algorithm. So there are also some open questions. So for instance, can we give quantum square classical algorithm for escaping from set of points? So I guess our algorithm really enjoys the, the phenomen, phenomenon of being a hybrid quantum classical that we only replace one step, the perturbation step. But maybe there are some other, a more clever way of making the classical perturbation uh, uh, to, to, to give a faster classical algorithm. I guess this is um, uh, definitely something we, uh, it is uh, worth to, to think about later. And also maybe another natural question is that can quantum algorithm achieve speed up in terms of our epsilon? So we really cannot improve the our Sloan dependence in this work because for the gradient descent part, it's totally classical. So if you want to make something clever along this, I guess this is going to be something intrinsic, but I'm not really optimistic about this because I also saw in this workshop that Robin Kothari talked about a very nice work about like no quantum speed up in terms of gradient descent, I think. I think Robin's talk really answers the question here, I guess. And also beyond local minima, does quantum credit advantage for approaching global minima? I guess this is, also some, uh, something that in general for classical optimization on people, after we escape from set of point, they, they really uh, want to um, be more ambitious and think about how to approach the global minimum or at least some local minima if it's uh, even nice structure. And this is also some, some question that maybe uh, later we want to think about. Okay, so this is the end of my talk and feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. So, so now there's already one question set in Q and A. Um, sure, let me take a look. So in the classical algorithm, which is what is the intuition for the step where they make a uniform perturbation? Presumably, they could have done a random walk similar to how you walk with the Schrodinger equation. Oh, this is a very good question. Um, 
I think from my understanding to the work of Jin et al., I guess in their analysis, if you do uh, like a random work, I mean, something other than the uniform perturbation, I guess it is plausible and it's actually uh, doable in the analysis, but it won't like uh, really uh, bring some advantage here. Maybe it's just their analysis too is not once enough, but I think actually in our numerical analysis, I mean, in this part, we just like uh, generally, uh, genuinely use the, uh, their uh, perturbative gradient descent method. So in our numerical evidence, we feel out that the classical perturbative gradient descent is not as bad as log n to the six. So in particular, I think it is like the key here. I think it, the behavior is more like p to the uh, a three, a p to the four, a p to the two, uh, somewhere between that. It is definitely above quadratic, but I think it's not as pessimistic about uh, p to the six. I think classically, maybe this log n to the six is not tight. I mean, it's probably their analysis is not once enough, but just in their original paper, the analysis, I mean, you can definitely ask whether maybe some random walk or something other than the uniform perturbation, whether they can work. But I think may maybe there are some still, something to improve in the analysis part. Yeah, so, um, so one, uh, thanks for a really uh, very clear, very nice talk and really nice results. Uh, I actually wanted to maybe for, follow up in a more general way on this, on this issue because, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful technique for, uh, for, for a speed up, but um, do you have thoughts on, you know, beyond improving the, the classical analysis on, on understanding this difference, where the, where the speed up comes from and how? How, how much the classical, uh, whether there are other, other classical algorithms that could be, uh, as you said, quantum inspired. Yeah. For a common is, is probably, it, it's just like the, the quantum simulation here is, is so different compared to the classical algorithm. So sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, my internet is a little bit unstable. Uh, it's very bad, thank you. Yeah, I think it's just like the, the quantum simulation is just so different compared to the classical algorithm. I mean, I mean the cubic speed up here is, is not, from my perspective, it's not like a very like satisfactory claim here. I mean, this is probably just the classical analysis is not good enough, or or maybe there are, uh, and I think maybe there are situations, there are space we put along that. But I think, I think from a high level perspective, my method is, our method is definitely as an area, we want to use the simulation to to uh, to overcome the the difficulty in terms of the like the the set of points. I think uh, for the more question that we are actually thinking about is that whether we can make a like even larger like a separation. Maybe maybe not a statement from set of points, but really to climb through. I mean, like this, like what is shown in this picture. I mean, maybe in the case where we are ready at some local minima, but we really want to get rid of some, some bad local minima. And this is really like, we really have to come through that. Not that for a set of points, we are not climbing through that. We just don't, we, we just don't like this case, we, we don't move. But for, for some general cases, maybe you want to climb on something, there is like an even more significant quantum speed up. This is probably going to make the class one quantum get even more different. But this is still some ongoing work that we probably need to figure out next. So, so on, on that on that front, have you looked at? Um, I mean, there's been a lot of thought about quantum tunneling in the context of adiabatic quantum co computation, and there are some mm -hmm. negative results there. So, do you have do you have uh, sort of preliminary thoughts about why how one would get beyond those negative results? Um, well, I guess there are there are always situations that we can figure out. I think. Like my comment to this is probably maybe like, uh, because this is like still like a quantum curve complexity result. So my comment is probably going to be the difference between like a total function and partial functions. I guess for the quantum curve complexity of total functions, the quantum and classical separation can be only at most polynomial and actually probably can be at most to the fourth power after using the quantum sensitivities theorem result and actually reasonably figure out by Aronson at all. But I think for partial functions, there can be huge quantum classical separations. I mean, I'm not in general pursuing some uh, some uh, very uh, like uh, pursuing some very general results, and I definitely know there are some negative results on the adiabatic side. But maybe, and I think I'm, I'm hoping for maybe for some specific kinds of non-quantization functions, we, we want to see whether it is possible to reach some exponential or at least super polynomial quantum speed up for such kind of non-convex functions. 
we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, may I ask you a question? So, uh, first of all, thank you for this very informative uh, and interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. So, my question is I would suspect a certain periodicity of the function f might be needed. So, um, the, the reason I think of this is uh, at one point you mentioned this Sobdiv norm uh, uh, regularity result provided mm -hmm. by Bergen. And as, if I remember that correctly, in that result, it will require the function v, the potential v of x and t, uh, to be periodic in x and uh, quasi-periodic in t. So I might, I would think, to get this logarithmic in t, maybe some certain, say, periodicity in x of the function f might be needed. And another point, that might be related is that uh, I'm not sure whether in the algorithm you uh, you ever use the uh, QFT to uh, to to calculate the derivative of the function f. If that is the case, then periodicity may not may also be needed to get this uh, uh, Fourier transform to be accurate for the derivative calculation. So that's uh, um, uh, sure sure my, my comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I see your question, and I think uh, both your questions are interesting. But I think the two things you mentioned there are related. I mean, I mean the the, the for the for the round Bourdain's result. I mean for this periodicity. The point is this: so at the beginning, we are actually at a very uh, concentrated uh, part that we have this kind of Gaussian wave packet, and we want to simulate that. So the periodicity here is just like at the beginning, we actually are very concentrated in the middle. So if you simulate for a short enough time, you actually you want like uh, the the vast majority of such kind of control function won't like uh, jump like jump out of the range a lot. So actually in our analysis, we just like draw like a specific like a, a slightly larger region and make sure if the simulation time is is short enough, actually you won't you won't make uh, out of this. And this is just like a standard trick on partial differential equation, just like if you, you don't move a lot. And because this is just like a, 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 like a like an estimate for the total variation distance. And also there is like a term here to to really bound back uh, for the for, for the tail, whether you're actually going to get out of that. And actually this is in general, we can handle this I mean, after having having the West, uh, like the West majority of the chunk in the, in the specific region, you just like can see the other parts to be periodic. I mean, this does not have any crosstalk in terms of the in terms of the the, the, the quantum free transform you, you later mentioned. And that part is is, is merely mirrored for the uh, to justify that the quadratic approximation is correct. I mean that does not even have crosstalk with the quantum uh, uh, that even, even with the gradient descent. I mean the quantum free transform in mean, this trick of Jordan's algorithm is applied to gradient descent, but the quadratic approximation part is applied to quantum simulation. So this does not have any uh, crosstalk. So hopefully this this helps you. Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, especially the, yeah, the, it's a, a localized Gaussian. Uh, right, right. Areas, so, yeah, so we don't need to worry about the bottom. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Exactly, exactly. Let's thank um, Tong Yang again. And, uh, thank you, thank you. Nathan Weave to the uh, stage. Next slide. All right.